Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Four Checking TV. I'm your host, Doug Glackey. Alongside me is are my co-hosts, Scotty Porterfield and Trevin T.K. Catellis. And tonight we are joined by our special guest, uh, Smitty from Around the 412. Smitty, how are we doing, dude? I am not Danny. That's all I'll say. So yeah. I'm doing good. My Wi-Fi is doing good. It's all good on this end. Yeah, definitely. And we were talking earlier about like the whole podcasting game. They pretty much taught all of us, like we all we all went to college for like multimedia type stuff. They mm -hmm. taught us all in college to have our own little like Verizon jetpack things. Mm. In case stuff like this goes down. So didn't yeah. teach Danny that. Don't know what Danny went to school for, but it wasn't that. Hey, Probably man, something analytical. Was, yeah, definitely, definitely like ma majored in hockey analytics. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, so we're going to get started. Um, since also it's incredible because on Friday we recorded an episode talking about who should get the last forward protection spot between Jared McCann and Brandon Tanev, and now they're both gone. So uh, so who did you think – who did you think wasn't? Like what were, you, what were your guys' lists that you thought one of those um, guys would have a spot? I literally – I think I, what I did not, was like I exposed not Carter. Carter. Okay. Yeah, I figured that Carter. would be it. See, that's – so I don't know, you know, I know, Doug, you, you've listened to our show with – have you listened to – did you finish the show that we had Jesse on just the other day? I got through most of it. I okay, so we had a conversation yet. about Jeff Carter, right? And I don't know if you guys saw that little excerpt, and I don't even know who wrote the article, where it was from. But it was about Jeff Carter because, like, logically, as Penns fans, we're thinking – what interest would Seattle have in a 36 year old forward with one year left on his deal? And if they were to want to take him, Jeff Carter could just threaten retirement. Jesse pointed out to us, Jeff Carter would have been fine playing there. He's out West closer to his family who still lives in LA, by the way. Um, and, you know, had that happened, I mean, okay, so be it, whatever. But I think that, you know, from the Penn's point of view, especially with, you know, the Malkin being just completely up in the air, when's this guy going to return? Um, they were going to protect all their centers anyway. But the thing that's interesting with that from a McCann standpoint is like Jared McCann, while I do like him better at left wing, he could play center. Mm -hmm. So like, why not protect him anyway? But I was just curious what your guys' list looked like if you were talking about McCann and Tanev there. But I, I guess Carter would be the logical one that you would have not had protected. But I felt like you know, what was it like the day after the season ended? Yo, he wrote an article saying that Carter was pretty much a lock to be protected. Yeah, I think we were all just trying to like will it out of existence. It just didn't happen. <laughs> Don't but, get me um, wrong. I, I love I love Jeff Carter. I love the fact that he's going to be on the Pens next season. But it just seemed like, again, from my point of view, at least at the time when I was making my, you know, what I would have as my protection list, like what interest would Seattle have in Jeff Carter? Yeah, that's that's where I was too. And I mean, even the day before the, uh, probably like literally the day after they traded McCann, like right before the trade freeze, I was like, I I, I think I sent out a tweet something along the lines of, I would protect Zach Aston Reese over Jeff Carter just to force them to take a contract. Yeah. And I mean, they still they still ended up taking a contract, so like mm -hmm. it's okay. For sure. The thing with Zach Aston Reese is, and I'm curious to see what his new number comes in at. But you got to feel like at the very least, it's going to be one million or plus less than what Brandon Tanev was making. Um, mm -hmm. And listen, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm just bashing Brandon Tanev because I feel like people that follow me on Twitter think that that's the case. Like, I love Brandon Tanev as a player. Um, I think what he does bring is valuable to a team. But in my opinion, with Bluter and Zach Aston Reese, he was like the third most important part of that line. Like, I don't think that Zach Aston Reese gets enough credit for what he brings to the table. Literally 100th percentile and even strength defense. Like, the dude should be up for Selkie awards, but he doesn't bring the fall offense to get that name recognition. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, literally, if they did the Selkie voting off of just analytics alone, he's probably the the winner or at least a nominee. Back People back know who he is. People know who he is. He's a household name. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, I know everybody just loves to like talk about how he doesn't score score enough goals or whatever. But if Zach Aston Reese is giving you eight to twelve goals a year while doing that, being in the one hundredth percentile and even strength defense, whatever you end up paying him, even, like as long as it's within reason, it's going to be worth every penny. I don't want to seem like I'm hijacking your guys' show, but as you were talking, there's something came, like just popped in my mind. 
I'm sitting here thinking like how different would perception of him be if he wasn't supposed to be a goal scorer coming out of college? Like when we yeah. signed him out of college, it was like, this guy's going to be like a 25 plus goal scorer brings a little bit of that Patrick Hornquist element, right? Like he goes to that area, the net and he'll score goals and get 30, but like, that's not the player that he is. And because he had that stigma coming out of college, I think people just expected way too much of him on the offensive side. Definitely. Yeah. Like- I remember whenever he like whenever he did whenever they did sign Astros, I remember the first comparison I saw was he's a Chris Kunitz type player. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking that's great. He's gonna be playing with Jake Gensel and Sidney Crosby. That's great. Now, you know, he's a fourth liner who's basically become the shutdown forward for the Penguins, and I'm fine with it completely. But I think that's the problem too is that they did set the bar, you know, pretty high just in the you know given the Kunitz comparison, given what we're used to seeing what we were used to seeing out of Kunitz during his time in Pittsburgh. So, but yeah. Like Dougie said, if you, I think if you give him like we talked about this a couple of nights ago in our, uh, we we're just texting. Like if you pay him like two million dollars, that's fine. You can live with that absolutely every day. I think. See, I'm more curious on the term because look at like the term that a lot of these bottom six guys are getting around the league. Barclay Goudreau got six years from the Rangers. I mean, what is Zach Gaston Reese going to get in terms of years? I think that. The truth is, I think I would try and shoot for a two-year deal with him, just to um, line it, line it up with the end of uh, Teddy Bluger's contract. But um, I don't know; it's difficult to um, think about right now. But like, I could I could easily see them giving him a four or five-year deal too. You know, um, it all really depends on how much they actually value him within the organization because. I know the uh, fan base perception as opposed to the organizational perception is two complete, two completely different worlds. But um, I don't know, man. It's, uh, it's good to see that um, obviously like, like I want to reiterate this. I'm not talking bad about Brandon Tanev, but um, it's great to know that they did not lose Zach Aston Reese. Um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited that he's back in the fold. And I, I don't – it's not going to be hard to replace Brandon Tanev. Um, I think you replace him internally, honestly. You know, you know it's going to be interesting to see who – like pulling in later, they're not close. Like from what yeah. I'm hearing, from what I've seen, it doesn't sound like they're anywhere close. But we talked about the McCann trade. Philip Hollander could be a guy that I think push – like Ron Hextall brought him up today. And, of course, mm-hmm. he was going to because he has, was asked about the McCann trade. I'm curious to see how quickly he can push for an NHL roster spot because though he hasn't played on North American ice yet, his game shouldn't be something that's like very hard to translate. He plays a very simple game. Um, I already brought up Patrick Hornquist once. Might as well bring it up again. He's drawn a lot of comparisons in the way that he plays to Patrick Hornquist. So I don't think that his game should take a whole lot of time to transition to North American ice. And just depending on, you know, what the, it's hard to say because they're going to do something in free agency, right? They're going to do something probably in terms of a small trade um, to alleviate some cap as well, whether it come in the form of like Marcus Pedersen. I know that we've talked about Tristan Jari again, you know, Jesse thinks that he actually still has some value around the league. It isn't seen, you know, how Penn's fans see him um, or even, you know, long shot, maybe there's somebody willing to take on Mike Matheson's contract because it's not like he had a bad year. I think that, you know, if you have another partner for him somewhere, similar to the way that like Cody CC was able to stabilize his game. I think Mike Matheson's a fine defenseman. So it's going to be interesting to see, but I, I I'm interested to see how quickly Hollander can, can push for a spot in that bottom six. Yeah. I like Hollander as like a potential third liner and I'm going to bring up another guy um, in the Penguins prospect pool right now, uh, Valtteri Pustinen. Mm, he's yep, going to make the jump to North America this year and he's drawn comparisons to Phil Kessel. Um, he's led HPK in scoring back-to-back years, and he's had over 50 points back-to-back years. And I think that, you know, he's one of those, like, late bloomer, like, outside outsider guys that might just break the fringe and come in and be, a, like, a regular. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? It, it's funny because, like, I, I really haven't – you said, like, a late bloomer. I haven't heard his name until recently, but his name started mm-hmm. to pop up on the map – Um, And again, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly I don't think his game is as quickly transitionable as Hollander, which we just mentioned. So, again, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly he can push for actual ice time at this level. Um, I would say that he probably I'm curious to see if he starts out in Wilkes-Barre, what kind of numbers he puts up down there. 
Yeah, I'm I interested think against that level of competition, like I think he could dominate down there. And then the question is just going to be: Is he just like? I'll relate it to baseball and say, like, is he just like a quad A type player where it's hard for him to transition to the NHL, but he absolutely dominates in the AHL. Yeah. You know, and even like a penguin pers- uh, comparison, Daniel Sprong, the mm-hmm. way he was when he was in Pittsburgh, you know? Good old Daniel Sprong. What did he score, like 13 goals this year for Washington? Something like that? Yeah. He, got he looked really yeah. good. It, it like really irritates me. Play- he was playing He's- in the top six a lot too. Yeah, he was, like, one of my favorite players. I have no idea why. I just, like, mm. love the dude. And, like, now it's just, like, it is what it is. But uh, somebody who I think should replace Brandon Tanev, I think adding the combination of size and skill that redeems the Horna possesses to that fourth line could add a really interesting element to uh, play off of Blue Green Ass and Reese. You know, what's funny about him is I could see him becoming like that same type of like folk hero in Pittsburgh, the called hero type, um, mm-hmm. just because of, of the things that you mentioned, like the size, the speed, the one, the one goal that he scored that was absolutely nasty. Like yeah. if he were to end up being like Tanev, the third most important member of that line, people would still just fall in love with him more than the other two, just because. Yeah, but that's definitely. interesting. I haven't, honestly, I haven't given him much thought as like an NHL regular, his, his, um, his scouting reports were kind of all over the place. And then he went out and in a very short sample size, granted um, just went against pretty much everything that was ever said about him in the scouting reports. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I just really think that out of all the guys that they have, he might be the one that can just play a, just straight up play a fourth line role and not bounce around throughout the lineup and just be like that concrete fourth line guy. You yeah, know. I think what was interesting, one of the first things that I saw when, when he came up, I was reading about him, was he doesn't have very good skating ability because of the size that he is. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I don't think that there's anything further from the truth, at least in terms of what I saw in that small sample size. Like, I thought he moved very well for a guy that's six foot seven. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, and I think that, you know, same thing goes for Jeff Carter. Like, everybody was saying that Jeff Carter was going to be look like he lost a step or whatever but like it's that it's that jordan stall deceptive speed thing where you just kind of like you're like half legging it through the uh center ice and then you go and just take off in the neutral zone you know yeah speaking of jeff carter one of his line mates i'm curious to see if the pens try to bring back Freddie Didgerow. I feel like his name really hasn't been talked about much, but I wonder what it would cost to bring him back on another, you know, one year deal, maybe two year deal. If, if there's another team that's interested, you got to give him that extra year. Uh, but I wouldn't think it costs much in terms of average annual value either. I would love to have him back around kind of in like a, um, kind of to be like a Chad Ruedel where he's like your super utility guy in the uh, forward group. And he's yeah. just that great depth guy, you know, because I feel like the Penguins haven't really had somebody the level of Gaudreau that can come in and play the way that he did. It just is like a depth scorer and someone to be like the 13th forward in quite some time. So like, I feel like, I feel if you're able to retain him for on like a two to three year deal where he's making like between 950 K and a million dollars per, you have to just go for it. Yeah, the thing is, too, I'm just like, again, I mentioned, like, what are the other moves going to look like? But I definitely see that there's like a path there, depending on if they decide to really just use all this cap space and go out and get a goaltender like that could very well be what they decide to do. Although I don't mm-hmm. want them to get into a bidding war and free agency for a goaltender. Um, I, I very well could see a scenario where you're looking at Freddie to as a regular in this lineup, not just as a 13th forward and being on, you know, whether that be replacing Brandon Tanev's role in that fourth line or on the third line. The truth is, I think that with the Malkin injury situation, there's a very good chance that Freddie could draw your opening. He could play. He could play center. Yeah. Yeah, I think that he'll be your opening like third line center, or you know maybe Hollander plays center because I know he can play center as well. Um, I think that there's a very good chance that the opening night third line would be Zucker, Hollander, and Freddie Goudreau, mm. and I'd be okay with that. You know. Um, free agency wise, like why I have Zucker on the third line is um, I really want them to go and just take a chance on Tomas Tatar. I think Man. that. See, when, I, go ahead. 
sorry, I think when Malkin's fully healthy, that's the type of guy that needs to play with Malkin. Um, and Carter can be perfectly fine with him as well. Yeah, I feel like he's kind of in, and this could be completely off base. We'll see what teams are willing to throw at him in free agency. I just, I think that he might be a buy low candidate this year. Like people are talking about mm-hmm. him. I don't think he's going to get nearly the amount of money. And it's not like he's that much older than guys. Like, I mean, people are talking about, Hey, we can't extend Brian Ross because he's pushing 30 years old. Tatar is 30 years old, but a lot of these guys, Zach Hyman, 29 or 28. Um, Brandlin is 29. I mean, all these free agents, they're, they're in that ballpark. So it's not like Tom Tatar is much older than these guys. I think on, you know, a two to three year deal and I, Honestly, I'm not so much as worried about the money as I would be the years. So if they can keep it, you know, two to three years, not to, not saying, oh, give him $8 million or something like that, but I wouldn't be as worried about it as long as it's short term. Yeah, I think like two to three years, like three, three and a half is probably the ballpark that they'd be looking at. It was, how was he just, healthy scratched? Why was he healthy scratched? Dude, there's so <laughs> much like with that Montreal team, I don't understand. Like there, the truth is no disrespect to anyone but Luke Richardson should have been the guy who became the head coach of the Canadians they were at their absolute best when Luke Richardson was coaching the team yeah another yeah. man that I think could come up in uh in, that I saw at least coming up for the Penguins in free agency was uh Ryan Getzlaff and that's an interesting one because obviously his time starting to wind down a little bit you know but another you, Jeff Carter ex- exactly you think <laughs> If we're going to be missing Evgeny Malkin for, you know, an, an unspecific period of time, and you may, like you said, you may need that third line center to step up here since Carter's going to be playing the second most likely. Would it be the worst thing to give that guy a run and have him, you know, maybe slide into a different role? Maybe it'll be like 13 forward as well. You know, he also has the relationship going back with Brian Burke. So there's a connection there, just like there was with Hextall and Jeff Carter. So that would be that'd be interesting. I tossed his name around, honestly, at the trade headline before they went and got Carter. Like, But it, it makes sense in the fact that Jeff Carter, I know they want him to play center, but could you imagine if he went back to left wing like he was playing last year up until we acquired him on Malkin's wing? I mean, that could be, you know, a whole new world for him where now he doesn't have to worry about, you know, playing defense in as much of a role, worrying about zone entries. He can just let his shot do his thing. And, I mean, that you're putting Jeff Carter in the best possible position when you just say, whenever the puck's on your stick, just fire it at the net. So, I mean, I'm not opposed to it because I think Getzloff still has something left in the tank. I'm just curious, like, is he ever going to play anywhere besides Anaheim? Yeah, another thing that I saw, another one that I saw too was uh, Dmitry Kulikov on the back end as well. Because obviously, because mm. you know, Dougie and I talked about the whole. Dougie brought up Ryan Suter's name like either an episode or two ago, and you know that was I was thinking, okay, left-handed defenseman, and Kulikov was one that I thought of there. So, so Ryan Suter definitely can still play and, and play. I think in like a second pairing role. Even I don't think he's at the point where he's like completely washed. Unlike the other guy they bought out in Zach Parise. Please don't mention his name for coming to the Pens. Um, but. Kulikov, man, he I, I feel like he's he's more of a name than anything at this point. Like his entire career, he's supposed to have been a better defenseman than he's been. And every year teams just giving him a chance, like hoping that he he finally finds it. I just I mean, we would have to be in a bad situation with defense. They like this is probably the scenario that would have to happen is we trade somehow and it's not going to happen. Matheson and Pedersen, obviously we have POJ coming up and we're looking for a third pairing left-handed defenseman. And even at that point, I think that they'd rather have Mark Friedman playing as offside as we saw last year. Yeah. That's the big thing that um, I think is going to be a huge storyline coming in through the rest of the off season is a lot of people don't think POJ is ready. Um, they think that he needs more time in the AHL to, get himself like prepared or whatever but like honestly from what I saw last year when he wasn't playing with Latang, he was perfectly fine you know and the only reason he struggled with Latang is they have too similar of a play style yep to you know mesh really well that's what I was going to say is I don't think that POJ is not ready I think it's just about the partner that you're playing him with I mm-hmm. mean if, if you throw Chris Letang out there with the wrong partner, he's not going to look good. Now you're going to say Chris Letang's not ready to play in the NHL. Uh, exactly. You know, so I think POJ's there. Um, I think that he is an NHL defenseman already. Um, I'm just curious to see who they end up having as his partner, because a guy like John Marino, 
Now he's not completely like Chris Chris Letang, but like it's mm-hmm. kind of of that same mold where I worry that POJ would fall into a si- similar situation last year as he did with playing with Chris Letang. And you don't have like that that stabilizer, if you will, in Cody Cece. I think that he's gone. So maybe like is it Chad Ruedel as POJ's partner to start off the season? Yeah, like I think that it could be either Ruedel or Friedman, and I don't like the idea of Marino playing with POJ simply because of how badly Marino struggled playing with Mike Matheson to start the year last year. Yeah. And I think that it's a very similar situation where, you know, they're, it's just like too, too much offense in a sense and too much chance taking and they get caught way too often. Well, here's the thing with, with Rui too, because I want to I want to circle back to him because I don't think he gets nearly enough credit either. I understand that he didn't play a whole lot last year. I, I but to me, when he played, he was like their second best defenseman. And in terms of just defense, defensive mm-hmm. defense, like he's he's their second or third best defenseman on their roster. And yet he was in the press box pretty much every night. Like I have no reservations about plugging him in 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 you know the uh, instance, and I think that's going to come true that we lose Cody CC to free agency. I'm completely fine with that. Like I like Cody CC for what he came here and did for a year. Congrats to him for rebounding and getting himself paid. I am not touching him on a multi-year deal where he's getting like north of three million dollars. I have no interest in that. I'd rather just play Chad Ruido every night. Yeah, I, I would too. I think we learned our lesson with that with Justin Schultz where, you know, it might start off okay, but eventually regression's going to hit and it's not going to end well. Yeah, let him go back to Ottawa or something. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Um, I heard that Philly had interest in, interest in him, but that was before they got I was going to say after Ellis, because I, I mean, I know that they need somebody on the left side now, I think, mm-hmm. you know, shipping out Goss' bear for – absolutely nothing just <laughs> packaging him with other assets to get rid of his cat what was he making like four and a half or something four and a half yeah yeah um yeah he's making four and a half and he was like their seventh d yeah hey maybe they should get mark friedman <laughs> <laughs> dude but uh but no yeah i, I don't I'm, I'm trying to like i don't really know that i see that as much of a fit you said that was before the ellis acquisition yeah. though right so that was before the ellis yeah. stuff yeah but um, one thing I want to touch on is uh, goaltending. Um, oh, boy. You said earlier, you don't want to get in a bidding war in free agency for a goaltender. Either do I. I think they handle this on the trade market. Um, I, saw, I saw today that they have apparently checked in on, with Arizona about Christian Dvorak, and part of me wonders if they could swing Darcy Kemper with that as well. I, I like both those guys. I mean, the Vork doesn't have a great contract, no. but I'm curious what he would do outside of Arizona. I mean, that's such a low scoring team. Their leading scorer last year was Kessel with what, like 40, 43 or something points. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't score goals there. I wonder what Dvorak would do in a, in an expanded role here. And, you know, should he come here, he'd have the opportunity to play either on a second or third line role. Um, the thing with the goaltending, right. And why I say, I don't want to get into a bidding war. I feel like there's as good of a chance as Tristan Jari bouncing back next year and being able to show that he is a guy that can perform in the playoffs as there is paying a guy like Linus Olmark $5 million and hoping that he's the answer. Like, I'm just, I am absolutely not about that. Now, if you want to, you know, go the trade route, sure. But even that scares me because I, you know, say you want to go after a big fish like a John Gibson, right? And the asking mm-hmm. price, there's going to be other teams involved if they find out that John Gibson's available. If we start, you know, getting involved in trade talks and we're dangling a guy like Jake Gensel to try to figure out the solution and net, because I've seen people throw that out there. Like, I just, I want no part of that either. No. Well, I've seen scenarios with that too, Smitty. And the one, and another name that came up instead of Gensel was POJ. And I think, I think somebody somebody said both of them. I'm like, I'm not doing it for Gensel. Yeah. Let alone here at POJ. I think that, you know, in a, in a perfect world, if you really want to work things out, you send Jari, POJ, a first and a fourth in order to make that work. I think that's the, I think and that's I, the way, you know. And I can live with that. It's like, I really do like POJ, but, you know, I don't want to be known as this guy that's like hugging prospects and never wants to get better because I'm just willing to hang on to these guys. Like, POJ is is going to be, in my opinion, a very good NHL defenseman. But I think that you can find another guy like POJ, whereas if you get Gibson, you have your franchise goaltender 
and finally give yourself a shot in net to get above average. Give me average goaltending in net in the playoffs. And who knows how far the Penguins go last year. So, yeah, I, I would I would hate to see POJ go, but that's definitely a deal that I would make. Yeah, and the thing that I'm going to touch on with the uh, John Gibson thing is that um, the idea of trading Gensel or maybe even POJ, I'd go as far as saying for that, it kills the entire idea of bringing in the guy to begin with, you know, um, because Gensel is a big part of the reason that your competing window is yeah. still open. And it's just, it would be a double negative. Like it really wouldn't help anything if you're giving up Gensel for John Gibson. Well, think about this. Let's take a step back for a second and think about, I know that we're competing for right now, trying to squeeze whatever we still can out of the mm-hmm. Crosby, Malkin, Latang era, but what is left after that? Who's going to be the next guy? I mean, Jake Gensel, right? That, that's yeah. right now what you would say is the answer for, you know, life beyond Crosby, the face of the franchise at that point. Yeah. If you trade him, I mean, you're, 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 really hurting your next window of contention already you might be improving what you have in net but you're not finding another guy to score 40 goals that can play along with side of Sid. and those guys don't grow on trees either that's the big no. making make and people are you know he makes what six and a half million dollars something like that yeah. somewhere yeah, between makes six, six. Yeah. yeah six i mean yeah that that's not even you, the, some of the contracts you're gonna see handed out over the next few weeks when free agency starts you gotta be like that's one of the best bargains in hockey. Obviously, it's not Sid's eight point seven, but it's pretty close. Yeah, and the thing is, is like you know, talking about like life after Sid, like that's the big reason that I was upset about them trading McCann because like you think about he's guys with potential. Yeah. yeah, he's young. He's he could be a part of the next score, and I'm like thinking to myself like, like I had myself convinced that he was a lock to be a part of the next core, especially whenever things started picking up with people saying that Brian Russ might leave next summer, potentially, Mm -hmm. you know, and that was just what I was thinking. And, you know, preparing for life after Crosby and Malkin makes me wonder if not, like if bringing Christian Dvorak in wouldn't be a, like a slam dunk. Cause he's still pretty. By the way, by the way, I should, I, you know, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I've had a conversation with a player that we just brought up and he doesn't think that he's going to play this year on that one year deal. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that Christian Dvorak could be an interesting option just to like expand well, everything beyond Crosby and Malkin. You mentioned Kemper. We already brought up John Gibson. I don't know what other goalies are going to be available in the trade market mm-hmm. either, but those are really the only two that I think of. Like, don't even talk about Jonathan Quick. I don't want to hear that name no. mentioned wow. ever again. Um, you know, and who else is out there? Like, who else is being mentioned as, like, this guy's available? I mean, that's pretty much it. No one. No one turns that. So I already mentioned that I don't want to get into a bidding war in free agency because of the cap hit. If you get into a bidding war in trades where you're talking about just having to hand out assets, Ron Hextall is not going to do that. I mean, we know how that guy is with draft picks and I'm completely fine with that. It's a complete turn from what we saw with Jim Rutherford, but you know, it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting because I know we Hextall is a former goalie. He knows the importance of having a guy in net that can get you there. So I think that, you know, despite his comments at the end of the season, he's not going to bad mouth Jari. Um, I think he knows what the problem was for this team, and he's definitely going to do something in terms of a solution. But I'm really worried about what that could be because I think he would rather go the route of overpaying in free agency because you're not giving up trade assets. Yeah, which is terrifying because, like, the only, the only I, option I, that I really like is Peter Mrazek. Like, that would be fine, depending on what the price was. I like correct. Olmark. I'm just worried I about what he's going to get in terms – like, people are talking about $5 million. I, No thanks. <laughs> Literally, anything above, like, 4.25 is not good. I mean, we're paying Jari three and a half. Like, I mean, yeah. again, that goes back to my point. It's like, would you rather and, – and they can't do this. You can't gamble on this same goalie tandem next year. But yeah. the chances of him rebounding from that and looking more like the guy that we saw make an all-star appearance and see for a good bit of stretch of hockey in 2020, 
I feel like there's almost as good of a chance of him looking like that guy again, as opposed to overpaying a guy in free agency, like a line of soul mark for what he could potentially get and hoping that he is the solution. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's just, and my big thing is, it's like, you know, Jonathan Bernier just got traded today. If Carolina fails to sign him, like I'm okay. Keeping Tristan Jari bring in someone like maybe a Jonathan Bernier, like a James Reimer to run with them mm-hmm. and on a cheapish deal. And that might be, might have us in business. I, I thought Bernier keep, had a nice year in Detroit, honestly. Yeah, he did really good. Um, he had great numbers. And, you know, I would personally prefer to keep Casey DeSmith in the organization simply because a team probably isn't touching a $1.25 million cap hit for a goal t- backup goaltender on waivers. Yeah, And you can just stash him in Wilkes-Barre, have him be your third goalie. And get back into the situation you had whenever uh, Murray and Jari were the uh, tandem. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that their their best bet is like you said. They don't, you know, overpay somebody in free agency. They don't go out and give up a ton of assets for a Jonathan Gibson. They rather just go with the 32 year old Jonathan Bernier, who had a really nice year in Detroit, and that's with a really bad team in front of him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on just like a one or two year deal. Yeah. Because even like, like you said, say you keep Jari, the Smith and him somehow in the organization, one of those guys could be, you know, a trade asset at some point if a team needs goaltending help towards the deadline. Exactly. And I think like, even if you grow more confident in um, the Smith or Jari throughout the year with Bernier in the fold, you could do like a competitive sell of Bernier at the at the deadline and recoup some assets that way. Yeah. See, but then we're going to be talking about, they're going to get into the playoffs and then Jari's going to falter. And we're going to be like, we we had Bernie on the roster during the season and then traded him. Or they're going to go into the playoffs (laughs) and play Jonathan Bernier and he's just going to destroy them. Yeah. That's, that's an even better outcome. But, um, you know, moving forward, uh, we're going to probably, we're going to talk about the expansion draft. Um, I thought it was pretty underwhelming for the most part, at least forwards wise. Defensively, I thought it was pretty good. Um, I thought it was pretty loaded. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're able to get Vince Dunn and Hayden Flurry as your one two punch on the left side, moving forward to start your franchise, that is that is unbelievable. Um, you know, and they have great people to pair with them. Like I think that. Dunn and Adam Larson together are going to be phenomenal if that is indeed the pairing. Yeah, they they were trying to talk to like Dom Moore and Chris Fowler, who were doing the show yesterday on ESPN2. They were trying to come up with like what their pairings would be. It's going to be interesting. I I really like what they have on the left side. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even Giordano there for a couple of years. I think, you know, you think he'll be the captain? You think he'll be the first captain in team history for them? I think he should be, but I could also see them doing like three A's with like him, Jordan Eberle, and somebody else. Mm, that's true. Yeah, you know? they could go that route as well. But yeah, anyway, I, I do like what they did defensively. Uh, we talked about this right before we started recording, though. It just seems like the forward group, and, and it's not finished. They have a ton of money to spend. We'll see what they do in free agency. But with some of the talent that was available for them to pluck, it just seemed like they took a bunch of bottom six guys. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, but I said I said the same thing to my dad last night. Like a lot of the guys in Vegas were just a bunch of bottom six guys, and then yeah. they all kind of popped off. You know, um, yeah, they're going to have expanded roles, and, and that's great for them. I mean, it's it's a great showcase for them. It's a fresh start. I just when you look, it's going to be interesting to see, like because now we've seen that happen with Vegas. You know, the Carl sends the Marcia so's trying to find who those guys could be on this roster, but looking at it right now on the surface, it's like, man, Eberle and McCann have to score like 35 goals apiece. Yeah. If I were a betting man though, I think one of those guys is going to end up being Mason Appleton. I Ooh, think I, I know Winnipeg. Yeah. Winnipeg fans yeah. are very upset with that. Yeah. I think he's going to pop off. Um, you know, kind of reminds me of an Alex Tuck type player where he just plays like nasty hockey and can just score a big goal here and there. And, um, you know, them being able to get Yanni Gord from Tampa Bay 
is massive no matter which way you spin it because you can play both top six center or top six wing. And, you know, what he's done in the past two years speaks for itself. I do like Yanni Gord. I think that was definitely like a slam dunk pick for them. Like if you're going, if I was looking at every team's protected and unprotected list, when I got to Tampa, I, I knew who their pick was going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, now there were certainly some teams like you mentioned, Vince Dunn. Um, want to pose this question to you. Do you think they should have taken Tarasenko or were they, do you think that they were wise to not run that risk? No, I'm taking Vince Dunn every single day of the week. Okay. Um, that might be, that might be slight bias, but like, Vince Dunn is one of those guys that I think, like, I think that in a year or two, he could be better than what Shea Theodore was whenever he first got to Vegas. Um, you know, he's somebody oh, wow. that I was, I was eyeing up for a while now, hoping that the Penguins would get him to play with John Marino, similar to how I think that he can thrive with Adam Larson because Marino and Larson have very similar play styles. Yeah, no, I definitely like Dunn. I just, even if even if Tarasenko for them was going to be a trade chip, I wonder what a team would have been willing to part with. But I'm sure that they listened to those offers and just decided, you know, we'd rather just have Vince done as a foundational piece for this team. Um, but yeah, I was just curious. Again, the, he was one of those ones that was kind of a toss up. But anyway, that conversation started with Yanni Gord, who I felt like was definitely the slam dunk pick for Tampa. Yeah. Did you hear about the um, offer that Philly offered them if they took Tarasenko? No. I mean, it was, was, a, gonna, was a multiple first. That's the only thing it was going to be Jake Voracek, uh, Robert Haig, and a first round pick. That's what I w- Frank said. I w- all your for it. Yeah, I wouldn't no, have I done, done, that, done either. that either. Give me, I would rather have just taken Vince Dunn to play for my team than do that. Yeah, because what like, is, I, think, I don't know what Haig's making, but I'm not, I'm not interested in Voracek's contract with what he's no. produced the last couple seasons. Uh, and that first round pick, I mean, Philly's not like is it was it is it Philly's own pick or was it from another team? I think it was Philly's own pick, but we're not like a hundred percent sure like what it was. Sarah Valley yeah. just said it was a first round pick. So yeah. like not knowing whether there's conditions on it or not, just assuming it's Philly's first round pick. I like I thought Philly was going to be decent this year. Now to me it's all about what Carter Hart does next year, but they should be a mm-hmm. relatively competitive team again. Like that first round pick, that doesn't mean much to me. It's not gonna be a high first. Yeah, exactly. And um you know, did you hear about what the uh, Coyotes were – or what teams were asking for to take on the um, Goss's Bear contract from Philly? No. They asked – one team asked for Cam York, who's probably the best defensive yeah. prospect not in the <laughs> NHL right now. And uh, the other team asked for the 13th overall pick in the draft. And they ended up trading him with, what, a second and a fourth or something seventh like that? Or something like Se- that. Oh, seventh, seventh, yeah. yeah something like that and i like i'm 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 literally sitting on break at work like sitting there thinking to myself like huh this is why they protected mike matheson <laughs> like yeah i mean that's the that's the thing with goss's bear is like man he's terrible in his own end but he does yeah. bring some value offensively if, if you have a good enough coach where they can shelter his minutes i think mike solomon mm-hmm. would be fine with him even like not that i'm saying pay pang was to acquire shane goss's bear but if we were to be yeah. in that situation or if mike solomon was coaching arizona i think that he would be okay with how he'd deploy him how about Arizona though? I mean, they, they came out and said that they were going to try to take like a more analytical approach, not throw money around. And they just decided to take on Andrew Ladd and Shane Goss's first contracts for like $10 million. They, they throw <laughs> like, money around, man. It's so funny. Um, but Goss's bear is a good ad for them just simply because they needed to replace um, Alex Goligoski to run one of their power play units. Well, they might trade OEL too. So yeah. Yeah, but I think if you trade OEL, Jacob Chickering's just like ready to go. Just like give him the I, lo- I love him. I love him. Yeah, dude. He is he's phenomenal. Like he's one of the if you take him out of Arizona and put him in like a big market like Montreal or Toronto, he mm-hmm. would be a Norris Trophy candidate every single year. The thing is I loved OEL just like two years ago and he just fell off yeah. a cliff. I know. I know. It's crazy how like both him and PK just chose to like fall off the cliff at the same exact time. PK, man. I remember like, I'm sure you guys do too. Like remember how much backlash Montreal got for making that trade. Subban for Shea Weber. Where's it going to look like a I know. 
Like Did you see? What was that, Scotty? I said Bergevin looks like a genius now for pulling that move off. I mean, Weber has more value to the, to the Canadians than PK ever did to the Predators or the or the Devils now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Shea Weber, though, <laughs> who knows what the future holds for him? At least they got that you know that out of him. Mm-hmm. The time that they did. Yeah, but. they did. Um, it sucks for him because like the dude literally just sold out. Like he went all out hoping that he'd win a cup this year and it just didn't go. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think, by the way, just while we're on the topic of Montreal and injuries, do you think there actually is something there with Carey Price or do you think that was their way of protecting him while not protecting him? I think there could be something there with Carey Price um, just simply because you'd see, you saw like after they got past like the third round and there were some games in the third round where he did look like very unlike himself like there were some games where he's just downright terrible so I could see there possibly being a nagging injury that may have been irritated yeah, but but they're talking about like missing you know a good portion of next season I just don't I don't think it's that like it wouldn't surprise me if he had excuse me some type of like surgery this off season to repair something I mean mm-hmm. you know that seems to be very common anytime that a team makes a deep playoff run you have like 20 guys to have to go and get off season surgery but to say that he's going to miss a substantial part of next season I think that was kind of them playing it up to make sure that Seattle wouldn't take him I don't think that I can't imagine they would take I wanted them to take him so bad though that would have been awesome it was just I a think great by Bergevin and I think it was a great chess move by Bergevin in general just I think that's what Kyle Dubas was hoping would happen whenever they dangled McCann it's like okay we'll just throw him out there but they won't actually take him and then you know they actually end up do taking him so I think that was just the way he hoping it, the way he was hoping it was going to play out was how it did with Montreal in that sense yeah I mean so Toronto essentially traded a seventh round pick in Hollander to make sure that they wouldn't touch anybody else that they left unprotected mm-hmm. like that that's that's how it took place I mean if they were, I'm assuming Toronto was probably hoping that they would bite and take Kerfoot, who he's not a bad player or anything like that. But I mean, giving McCann over him every day of the week. Um, exactly. I am just surprised, though, that Toronto went with a 4 4 format for protection as opposed to the seven forwards and three defensemen. Like, were they that worried about making sure to protect Hall and Brody that they had to go with four and four? They were that worried about protecting Justin Hall. Like, seriously. Um, which is crazy because like he's not even like his his underlying numbers. You protected Justin Hall. You protected Justin Hall instead of being able to protect three more forwards. Like I know. You but, lost like, Jared McCann myself, because Yeah, you know, my big thing is is like I don't know how they even thought that they would like bite on Kerfoot over McCann. The difference between the two of them is like night and day. Yeah. You know, it's just crazy. But um, literally, Kyle Dubas is obsessed with Justin Hall. It's honestly starting to get incredible at this point, just simply because, like, he's the first guy that he fully developed and Mm -hmm. turned into an NHL player. Right. Yeah. And I mean, maybe I guess that does play into it. Now, should it? That's a different conversation. But. I don't know. Like I saw their protection list, man. And I feel like they were one of the very few that went with a four, four format as opposed to the seven, three. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, man, you're leaving a 25 year old guy that can play center and left wing making $2.9 million. Who I I understand last year, you can say it was an outlier year, but was one of the best five on five players in the NHL last year finally started to be that type of player that would actually carry the puck across the blue line himself and Jared McCann. You left that guy unprotected to be able to protect four defensemen. And I just, I don't get it. You know, my dad was, uh, was listening to, uh, I guess Staggerwald was on probably 93, seven or something today. And he said something pretty interesting. He said he, you know, he was given like his like, you know, take on the whole Seattle thing. Mm -hmm. And he brought the take that I thought was incredibly hot was that, he thinks McCann, this was McCann's peak. Like, this was Jared McCann's peak. And, I mean, I know. I, I wasn't buying it either. And the thing is, like, I'm kind of torn at the same time, though. You know, when you look at a guy like Jared McCann, you know, everyone says, oh, yeah, he has this potential to be a goal scorer. And, you know, 
if he's a goal scorer, you know, his only his career high is only 19. You know, he's only had 19 career goals as a, in one season for his career, like his his season high. Mm-hmm. I and mean, I don't know if it's like that was again. This is Staggerwald's take, not mine, obviously, but. I mean, everything that, that has happened with him pretty much has just been based off of potential. You know, it's like the scene from Moneyball where all the guys are sitting at the table and they're talking about how good the guys, how good of a hitter he is. And he's like, well, if he's a good hitter, why doesn't he hit? It's the same deal with McCann in a way. You know, it's like, he's a goal scorer. Why doesn't he score? You know what I mean? He hasn't, had, he hasn't hit the 20 goal plateau yet. So, yeah. Well, granted, he would be, uh, you know, the last two years shortened. So he would have been over. 20 by I feel like a decent margin like he, he scored at a 50 point not 50 goal 50 point pace last year and again he's still only 25 so I can understand the thought process in saying his underlying numbers might never look as good as they did last year but I still think that you're, you're talking about and again he's only making 2.9 million dollars so like what exactly does he need to achieve in terms of stats and in terms of points goals assists in order to say that he's a good value at that price like it's he's provided that for sure. Like he's a player that should be making somewhere between four and $5 million right now and potentially more than that on his next deal. I'm so, you know, I've not, now I'm just getting upset again that we didn't protect Jerry McCann, but I think what it comes down to is at the very worst, he is a guy that m- maybe he never will be that, that center that we were hoping like a third line center. Maybe he is better suited to play left wing, but if that's the case, you're looking at a left winger, that drives play and has one of the heaviest shots that we saw in the Penguins roster. I'm sure that that would carry up. I mean, he's not going to have as heavy a shot as Austin Matthews, uh, but one of the heavier shots on Toronto's roster as well. I, I do think I'm curious to see where he is going to play in Seattle and who he's going to play with, but it wouldn't surprise me to see him go out in an 82 game season and score 25 plus goals. Yeah, I agree with Smitty. And I think that, if you're Seattle, you need to let basically let the power play run through him. Um, I thought you were to say they should extend him before he no. has a ridiculous season and can't afford him next year or something. But I mean, they could, but you know, thing is though, it's like if you wait it out and he has a really good year and he scores like 25 or 30, he's probably like a six million dollar player. Yeah, or close that's what I'm saying. I, I, if I were them, I'd be like trying to get his agent on the phone as soon as they picked him and been like, what's he looking for right now? Yeah. Now, based off yeah. the season that he had last year, again, I think he is somewhere in between like at the very least a four to $5 million player. Yeah. But with some of these contracts you're seeing handed up now, that's only going to go up. So say he goes out there and does lead in, in again, we're, we're talking about the talent on this team right now. So forget about the number. What if he leads this team in goals or is like right there with Jordan Eberle? Like that alone is going to drive up his price tag and Seattle's going to have the money to spend. Now, do they want to get like Vegas and throw around money on these match term deals so that they're in cap hell in four years? I don't know. Maybe Ron France will be a little bit smarter than that, but Jerry McCann is a guy that I could see being like the first guy that Seattle hands a decently long-term contract to. Yeah, I could see that. You know, he's one of those, He's one of the few guys on the forward group right now that you can see as a potential building block for that team. Um, you know, like we already talked about how Vince Dunn and Hayden Fleury are going to be guys you build around on that defense. But uh, out of the forwards, Jared McCann is probably one of the few right now that you build around. Um, now let's well, – to the, to the, This is the last thing I want to say about Jared McCann. Just to the point that, that Scotty brought up. Um, that they were talking about on 93.7. Don't get me wrong. There is definitely some streakiness to his game. But, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, you're looking at a guy that's only making $2.9 million, is still only 25 years old, and has already shown that type of promise. Now, if he's able to put all of that together and not be so streaky, actually have some more consistency to his game. Also, I mean, it's not something he can control, but stay healthy as well. I mean, again, this is a guy that I feel like we could be talking about as one of the better, assuming he stays at left wings, uh, one of the better left wings in the game. And I think that's another knock on him, too, was the fact that, you know, Brandon Tanev has more postseason goals than he does all the time. You know, that's another thing to bring up, too, is that, you know, we can't yeah. still have in the playoffs yet. So he has that, I don't want to say playoff choker, you know, label on him, but 
I mean, you can definitely make that there's, case. There's a stigma right now. Yeah. He, and, and until he does it, he's going to have that hanging over his head. Exactly. And that's the only thing that's going to hang over. Like you said, it's going to hang around him for a while too, until he does, until it does happen. So obviously you wish that guy the best moving forward because, you know, you see how, you see, again, it's, like I said, it's all been based off potential. You see what he can do, but, you know, it actually has to help. Said, while we were talking about this, I said that, that was the last thing I was going to bring up before, but actually this is going to be the last thing about him. I thought it was hilarious, though, to see people go from when he was, like, kind of running the power play, um, you know, when Gino was out, and then Gino comes back, right, and everybody's like, this guy, you can't take McCann off the power play. Like, we understand who Gino is, but you can't just throw him back on there because of his name. Jerry McCann's the best player on the power play. And then those same exact people turn around and say that he isn't a big loss and, you know, should have never been even been consideration for being protected. We would have rather have had Brandon Tanev and that was before Brandon Tanev got picked anyway. But like when we traded McCann, it was like, Oh, who cares? He wasn't a big part of this team anyway. Short term memory. That's... Yep. The, the toxic trade of the Yenzer, you know, <laughs> I'll I know it too well. How soon they forget. <laughs> the thing that killed me was I, I saw someone tweet that um, basically trying to go to bat for Jim Rutherford for whatever reason, saying that, uh, you know, an analytical savvy team in Seattle or a, an alleged analytically savvy team in Seattle. So um, three former Penguins. And I, was just I like, know who you're talking about. You talked about I a see. certain writer from the Post Gazette. Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> like, I was just like, dude, like, come on. Like, yeah. I just I just saw it as like a little bit of a reach. Hey, shout out to excuse me, shout out to Alexiak though. Got a nice deal in Seattle. He did have he he's had a couple. He's you know piled compiled back to back pretty solid seasons there for Dallas. So, I mean, no knock on him, but it was definitely surprising for me to see him get like twenty million dollars, something like that. You think that's an overpayment in a set in a way? I so the thing you contract for him. Yeah, if you look at Seattle's defense, who else that they took like where is he going to fit in there that it's like worth paying him that? Cause they're paying him as if he's like a second pairing defenseman, but with who they took on that left side, I think that he'll probably be on the third pairing. And I guess from that standpoint, it really doesn't matter because you get, you know, good defensemen regardless of where you want to put them. Um, but I was definitely surprised to see him get that. I would have thought, actually, I didn't even expect him to be Dallas's pick, but when I saw that they were going to take him and sign him to extension, I would have th- thought it was something like three years, three million per something like that. I mean, five years. See, that's you're you're gonna every time that I bring up a contract, it's gonna be more about the years for me than it is the money. Yeah, I'm with you on that. You know, and I was just thinking about this before we started recording. Um, who's to say they don't make a trade at some point for like a right-handed offensive defenseman? That's who he ends up playing with, similar to how um, Vince Dunn should play potentially play with Adam Morrison. Mm. I think that brings Maybe. great yeah. balance. Yeah. Very well. Um, it's going to be so interesting to see how that, that back end shakes out. Cause they took so many guys that are like, if they, if they were to trade one, they're definitely going to be hockey trades. Like you're not talking about guys that you're yeah. for draft picks for. They're going to be able to actually get something back for these guys. And maybe that's how they improve their forward group is they just took the best defenseman available. Um, and then they're going to move out defensemen from forwards. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what they do there. I definitely trust Ron Francis. Like, I think that they got something good there with him. I think he's a great guy to have running the show. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, big thing, just like from something that happened with Ron Francis's former team today, the Carolina Hurricanes, them trading Alex Nadelkovich to Detroit. Um, I found this is just like, just, I was shocked. Like I was straight up, like, honestly, I was speechless when I saw this. Um, and to think they only recouped a third round draft pick and the UFH rights to Jonathan Bernier, who they may not even sign. Is just I don't think they are. Minute. I think that their plan is now to bring back Mrazek. And I think that he's going to be off the market. Yeah. The thing with the, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the thing with the is I understand like, the small sample size, right? Because everybody, it's like, you know, how asinine it looks now that we handed that contract to Tristan Jari. So, you know, I guess having the benefit of hindsight in looking at our situation compared to theirs, it's like, I guess I understand them not wanting to commit to him that much, but for what he got, like just two years, $3 million each. I mean, you couldn't commit to him for two years. 
I mean, for what he showed you down the stretch. And, and I guess the argument is Carolina, and I saw this from a lot of their fans, they feel like the team that's in front of the goaltender makes it so that the, it, they can literally have any goaltender in that, and it doesn't matter. Like, all their goalies played decent last year, and that's why they'd be completely fine. But I just mentioned bringing back Morozik, but are they going to spend that money? I think that that's an argument against them, too, is they never seem to want to spend money, and that's why they weren't willing to pay Nadelkovich the $3 million per. Well, that's the problem here now is, like, I don't – I mean, I don't really think that team is necessarily good enough to, you know – just throw any goalie back in net and be like, okay, well, let's give him an off. Let's let's give him Jari and see how that works. Yeah, exactly. Do. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, we'll throw any goalie back. So we'll throw Tristan Jari back there, and you let me know how much fun it is. But no, really though, I mean, you just, I like I said, Doug sent that in our group chat, and I'm like, why? Like, what was what was the thinking with Carolina there? I thought that that was your guy going forward. You know, it seemed like that would be the case at least. And then you're just like, here, let's dump him off to Detroit good for the Red Wings. That's going to, you know, really help the whole rebuilding process over these next two years. I just love uh, Eisenman's quote. He said, you're going to oh, have yeah. to ask them why they were comfortable doing that. <laughs> it's like, I want to, I want to see more GM say that. I feel like the opposite end of pretty much every Jim Rutherford trade since 2018 could probably say that exact quote and it would apply. The thing with Nadelkovic too, is like everybody wants to bring up his, his lack of NHL games that he has. You know, despite him being, what is he, like 25 or something like that? Mm -hmm. 25, 26. And it's like, you start to look around the league. That's typically the age now. Like, guys are spending more time in the minors as goalies, and that's completely fine. Like, bring them up when they're ready. Not everybody has the exact same timeline. You know, you don't want these guys to come up beforehand and not be ready. Look at Seattle. You know, their pick for uh, Washington, Vitek Vanacek. He played a ton of hockey games, not at the NHL level. Um, You know, he played a ton in the minors, and he – had a very nice first season in Washington to the point where they're upset there that they took him and they're like, Oh man, if Sam Sonov isn't the guy, we're really in trouble here with their goaltending situation now. So that's another guy, small sample size that a team was willing to take a chance on. I think Detroit won that trade very handily. Easily. Yeah. And I, and I think if Scotty, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, obviously now you have to sign Mirazic. I don't know if you can really necessarily go out in free agency and try and sign a goalie because, you know, you still have some of your own guys that you need to pay. And I mean, I don't know if Dougie Hamilton's still a possibility for those guys anymore, but I mean, I think they should make that a priority if they could, but I don't think it is going to be that way anymore. You know, if, if so, you know, I, I'm the one that originally brought up Mrazic, but as I'm sitting here saying it now, I'm like, man, those guys don't like to spend money in free agency, even if it's retaining their own guys. Like the reason that they didn't bring back Nadelkovich on the, they didn't want to go to arbitration with him. They offered him $1.5 million a year. So he ends up getting double with the Red Wing. $1.5 million. Are you kidding me? Uh, but anyway, like I, I just, so that's why I'm starting to second guess this Mrazic thing because it's like, if you're going to sign Mrazic for what he's probably going to get, considering that it's going to be a bidding war in free agency for a team that needs a goalie, you could have had definitely an Adelkovich and at least been in the conversation to retain Dougie Hamilton. I think that that's completely off the table right now. And I'm, I have no idea what they're going to do. I like Carolina. I think that they were in a good spot. And now I'm just like, what are they doing? Yeah. And that's the thing with Dougie Hamilton that I want to bring up is um, they're in the same situation that St. Louis was last off season with uh, Alex Petrangelo, where the year before Petrangelo's contract year, they just had to bring in Justin Falk. And um, that kind of screwed long-term perspective that screwed up their ability to retain Petrangelo. And it's the same thing with Brady Shea and Dougie Hamilton. Um, You know, they have so many, like even you can even say Jake Gardner as well. Like Jake Gardner is making like $4.1 million and Dougie Hamilton or, and uh, Brady Shea is making closer to 5.2. And it's like, if you're able to get rid of one of these guys, especially since you have Jake Bean back in the fold now, knowing that um, he wasn't the pick for uh, the expansion, uh, which mm-hmm. I was surprised about. I thought it was going to be Jake Bean the entire time. Um, you know, if you're able to move one of these guys out, you might be able to bring back Dougie Hamilton. But it's kind of difficult right now because you're committing – almost close to $10 million into bottom pairing defensemen. Yeah. As long as they don't touch Slavin, 
or Pesci. Those are my guys. I think, see, that's the thing is like, I think they would be wise to look to move one of those guys if it meant being able to retain Dougie Hamilton. But should mm-hmm. they lose Dougie Hamilton, I don't think that they're completely screwed on the back end. Like, I think that they still have a solid foundation there. Now it's yeah, just about the goaltending. I, I agree. Yeah, exactly. You got to just find somebody to just do the job in that. Um, but that this is a good trade for Detroit because I'm not saying that Nadelkovich might be their is going to be could be their guy, but if anything, he's a really good stopgap to whoever is going to be their franchise goaltender. I know we're going into the draft tomorrow, and there's been a lot of talk that they might be the team that drafts Jesper Wallstedt um, mm. in the top ten. And you know, there's been talk that Wallstedt is more NHL ready right now than both Spencer Knight and Yaroslav Askarov were on their draft days. And, you know, really... When was the last time a goalie went in the top 10? Man. Spencer Knight was 13th. Was yeah, Spencer Knight was 13th. Askarov, I think, was like 12th. Yeah. It's been a while. I mean, there's a lot of people against it. It's kind of like taking a running back in the first round for the NFL draft, so... Even though Pittsburgh does know all about that, um, yeah, I'm I'll be curious to see what they do. But I, there's people that think that Delkovich has like top ten to twelve potential in this league as a goaltender. So that's I think why Detroit is getting such high marks for this move. Again, it's a small sample size what we saw in Carolina, but I mean he looks like a guy that still has a ton of room to grow in to become a better goaltender than even what he showed. Yeah, I totally agree. Um... I'm looking. The last time and I feel like it has goal. not happened for a while. Carey Price, fifth overall, two thousand five. Man, that'd be the first time in sixteen years that a goalie went top ten if it happened. Yeah. Fun fact: What number? Um, when does Detroit pick? Six. Yeah. Fun fact, Jack Campbell went 11th overall in 2010. I did not know that. Crazy. Very crazy. Um, now, what are you guys thinking tomorrow? Are you thinking trades are going to be crazy? Going I expected more activity today, honestly, than what we got. So, I, if I was a betting man... I'd say, yeah, we see the action ramp up a little bit more. Um, as long as the Pens don't make a move for Zach Cassian tomorrow, I'll be fine with whatever happens tomorrow. That There, there are two <laughs> things off limits. There's no Zach Cassian and absolutely no Nick Deloria. Oh, man. See, I saw somebody – I th- it might have been Danny, actually, um, that mentioned Deloria, and it's like at least his – even strength defense matches up with yeah. uh, with Bluter and Zach Aston Reese. Now, I definitely don't want it to happen, um, but, but it was just funny to see that it kind of like, I think he's like 76, 78th percentile, even strength defense or something like that. Yeah. Now he's not, it still doesn't make him a serviceable player, but he kind of fits that mold. So I'm, I'm really like you just praying that that doesn't happen either. Yeah. Like I keep seeing like, all this cap space coming and, you know, the potential of like a Marcus Pedersen trade and like the fact that they may go into free agency with almost double digit million dollars in cap space for the first time in a long time. And I, I literally, I texted this to you the other day or yesterday, actually, it's both exciting and horrifying at the same time because you don't know which direction they're going to go with it. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a position that we haven't been in <laughs> a lot. We're like literally always right up against the cap. Um, so Mm -hmm. any type of space that they're going to be able to create, I mean, you mentioned Pedersen, um, you know, I don't know, I'm sure that, oh, you were the one, you texted me it too, um, that they had already kind of been shopping Pedersen, if you will, and also listening on Tristan Jari. I mean, the amount of cap space that they could potentially have, if these rumored moves actually come to fruition, I mean, I wouldn't take anything off the table, but like you said, it's also terrifying because you don't want to see them hand a multi-year, multi-million dollar deal to a guy like Nick Delorier or go out and acquire Zach Cassian, who's making like $4 million for some reason. Yeah, that's my worry, but I'm also kind of excited if they were to move Pedersen, they might be able to get somebody to play with Marino 
way cheaper than what they're paying Marcus Patterson right now. You know, yeah. like I see that's going to be like the key John, because yeah. for as much crap as everybody throws towards Patterson, it's just because he's underwhelming. Like he is the perfect partner for John Marino. He does yes. one thing and that's why people aren't a fan of his game. But the problem is like the, the problem with that, theory that way of thinking is that that one thing is very useful when he's very good at it he literally just does not let teams come into the his own zone he mm-hmm. just is a total shot suppressor and he just lets marino play john marino type hockey but you really don't notice him because the puck's never on his stick and when the puck is on his stick if he makes a mistake it's much more noticeable because it's like the one time a game where the puck is on his stick yeah and i think you know Obviously, this is my own thing I've come up with. I think that Marcus Pedersen suffers from Ole Mata syndrome in the sense of he's okay 85% of the time, but that other 15% of the time, he's getting blown up so bad that that's the only thing that the common fan remembers is him getting lit up on a bad play or having like a really bad turnover or something of that nature. I mean, that, that's a that's a good parallel because Ali Mata, another defenseman that was playing in the top four, making $4 million, perfectly fine contract for what he brings to the table. Yeah. But, you know, again, he's that stabilizer for the puck-moving defenseman. So when he actually has the puck on his stick and it doesn't go well, it's it's much more noticeable. Also, he gets caved in way too much for a guy that's six foot four. Please add some muscle. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Dude, that's why that's that's why I said John Merrill like right after they first got oh, eliminated yeah. because I'm just like, you know, really good defensive defenseman, pretty big, pretty strong, would probably play well with John Marino and command under three million dollars. Yeah, I have no idea what John Merrill's gonna get. I would def I I think it has to be under three. Yeah, you know, and I think. You know, if you're if you're able to pay your second pairing left-handed defenseman something between like two and a half and three million per year, it's it allows you to keep Mike Matheson around and it not be, you know, burdensome. To yeah, like with Matheson, him. where I'm at with Matheson is like it's a tough spot because with a contract like that, it's like if you actually have an opportunity to move it, you should do it. Mm -hmm. the first chance that you get but it's also like i don't want to attach any other assets to move it because it's not like this guy's a completely you know he's not jack johnson he's not hindering the team in that way like he's a serviceable player for them so it's Mm -hmm. like why would you attach assets to this guy to move him out when he's still bringing something of value to the team yeah and i i'll go as far as saying that what from what we saw last year mike matheson is absolute worst was better than Justin Schultz at his absolute best mm. towards the end of that contract, you know? Um, yeah, Mike Matheson did have a rough stretch. So did Cody CC, but after they both got healthy scratch for that Sunday afternoon game in Washington, they were both able to come back and really just be that stabilizing force on the defense. I mean, they were getting deployed as the second pairing for the, the entirety of the second half of the season. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we know what Matheson brings in the offensive zone. It's just wild how how night and day he can be in his own zone. But I've never seen somebody escape a terrible situation the way that he does. Like it's just it's so easy for him to just make a play to himself on the boards and escape from three guys. It's it's yeah. unreal. And honestly, I've never seen anyone make zone entries like he does and just go break off and like do like a little breakaway like he does just simply because like you know with like a defenseman like Latang, it's more cerebral and controlled but like with Mike Matheson it's like it's like a wild horse man like he just, he just takes off and you have no idea what's going to happen but you know you're in for an adventure yeah 100% so yeah um, Scotty what else are you thinking as far as just what the uh, what the Penguins have to offer, I mean, a lot of it's just going to come down to you know what Hextall's plan is. I think with the goaltending more than anything, you know, I think that's just I don't know if he's going to let Tristan Jari like Smitty touched on earlier. I don't know if he's going to let Tristan Jari ride things out or if he's going to try and make a trade for somebody. Truthfully, I think that you know the Penguins will be fine in terms of defense. I feel like 
like you said, POJ is ready to be uh, on the come up. I'm willing to part ways with Cody CC just because, you know, there are going to be offers there. Um, another guy that we talked about a little bit earlier, Freddie Goudreau. Um, can we see him potentially landing in Toronto? If they can get, if they actually end up losing Hyman, you think he'd end up in Toronto again? Or well, not again, but just end up there? Hmm. I could That's see interesting. So, yeah, I mean, they brought in McCann for a cup of coffee, never played a game for them, thought they were adding him to the forwards. That didn't happen. Uh, they're going to lose Zach Hyman to Edmonton on in seven or oh, seven year deal, I guess, right? Because it would have been, if they would have got it done today, it would have been eight, right? Or would it still I think be eight? They could still, I, I think they could still get it done and have it be eight. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's day. before before free agency. Why was I thinking the draft? Yeah. I had the draft in my mind yeah. instead of free agency. Yeah, you're, um, good. you're good. But yeah, so for $5 million a year, probably, I think they end up completing that. I think they want the eight years. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Toronto's definitely going to be looking to add a forward. His type of game does make – I think his type of game fits anybody, though. Like, you could throw any team out there for Freddie to draw, and I'd probably say, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, a guy that can play center or both wings, wins face-offs at, like, a 50-plus a percent clip, uh, despite not playing center that much. Good playmaker, decent shot. Going to make maybe a million dollars. I mean, Yeah. I could definitely see it. Any team that's going to lose multiple forwards, I think that there's going to be a little bit of a market. That's why I'm worried about the Pens having to throw an extra year his way to retain him. Yeah, and another Penguins forward that's going to hit the free agent market that I think it makes sense for them would be Evan Rodriguez. You know, like you look at Zach Hyman type of players, and I think Evan Rodriguez fits that mold. I think he would play that role better than Jimmy Vesey did last season in Toronto. Um, my god I mean dude we all I I, I thought he was going to be incredible there but it just didn't work out and if I was Toronto I'd bring back Alex Galchenyuk mm. that's interesting too yeah you know? just make sure he doesn't turn the puck over at the blue line right to start overtime yeah yeah I mean but like really like the entire year obviously that's a big mistake to make but like that was the only mistake yeah, he really yeah. had the entire year it was just horrible timing so but yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing what tomorrow holds for us um i think that the penguins are probably going to be involved in the trade market at some point um i'm just really hoping that it isn't in a negative aspect next is not going to be as quiet as he is vocally when it comes to his activity in the next few weeks yeah, honestly, like, I think, you know, obviously, like, after the conversation that we had tonight with you and some of the stuff that you said to us in passing, there's going to be, like, a nuclear type of trade that goes down. Um, like, it's going to be a big, big move. I don't know what it's going what, what to be for, but something big is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get the sense that we're going to see something, I would say uncharacteristic, but we really haven't let this front office get their feet wet completely. I mean, they made the Jeff Carter move. That was really much it, pretty much it, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. the Jerry McCann deal, obviously, you know, kind of put in a weird spot with the roster that they had constructed for them and the expansion coming up. Um, but we haven't seen them really do much to this point. I have a feeling that we're going to see something that we would consider a little bit uncharacteristic in terms of Ron Hextall. Just because going back to his Flyers days, like, yeah, he was always very, you know, not willing to part with assets, if you will. But I think that those teams were in a much different place as well. Like, when was he ever in a spot where you have Sidney Crosby and company where you're trying to capitalize at least one final time on a championship window? He didn't have that in Philly. So I just think it's a different scenario for him, and he's going to be more willing to part with these assets. Exactly. Um it's more of an open book and, you know, just because us as fans might be attached to certain players does not mean that Ron Hextall is going to be, um, you know, I think we're literally the only untouchable players are probably Crosby, Malkin, Latang, and Gensel, hopefully. And the rest of them are up for grabs. Yeah. I would say that even, even my boy who I brought up here, Rusty, I don't think that he's off. He's off the table. Um, 
like I said, I, I, I do. I think that there definitely is a shot that he gets extended. I don't think that it happened. It would probably have to happen before season. I don't think that they're going to want to worry about that in season. I think he yeah. either gets extended before the season or he just, you know, the pick. So I'll put it like this. My three most likely scenarios with Brian Rust are he plays out this final year as the Penguins own rental pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yep. He gets extended. He gets traded. I would put those in that order. Yeah, I I agree. You know, I agree. We're just going to have to wait and see what happens. But uh, regardless, probably going to be a fairly busy night busy day tomorrow and uh it's gonna be a fun to watch it all unfold uh anything else you guys have before we start wrapping this up let's go pens yeah baby <laughs> let's do it uh smitty anything big that you guys got coming up at the at around the fall too and where can we find you on social media dude uh hockey wise i'm trying to think uh why well, you know brian russ is going to be coming back on for sure we're trying to still set that up we wanted to have the expansion draft and, and this whole process pass first before we started to work on that but he will be coming back on the show um which is good uh, i'm trying to think if we have anything else hockey wise coming up we just did the show with jesse marshall he'll probably be coming back on again after draft and a little bit after free agency once the pens make a move or two um you can follow us at around the 412 uh, that's on all social medias. Check out our YouTube. We do our show uh, live on there and on Twitter, but also, you know, we do, we post clips throughout the week from the show. If you missed anything, break it down in segments, if you will. Uh, you can follow me at Zachary Smith 412. And as always, it's been a pleasure, boys. Awesome, man. Thank you for be, coming on late notice. And uh, for sure. All right, oh, yeah. I'm not, like I said, I'm going to have to hassle Danny about that, but yeah, I'll make sure he's on Go for it. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys. This was another episode of Four Checking TV. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Four Checking TV and subscribe to us on YouTube and uh, find us wherever you get your podcast from. All right, guys. Thank you. Good night.